America and other free and open societies face crucial challenges and opportunities abroad that affect security and prosperity at home. This is a series of conversations with guests who bring deep understanding of today's battlegrounds and creative ideas about how to compete, overcome challenges, capitalize on opportunities, and secure a better future. I am H.R. McMaster. This is Battlegrounds. On today's episode of Battlegrounds, our focus is on Lithuania, a strong NATO ally in Eastern Europe. Our guest is Ingrida Šimunica, Prime Minister of Lithuania. Prime Minister Šimunica served as Director of Lithuania's Tax Department from 2002 to 2004, the Under Secretary of the Ministry of Finance from 2004 to 2009, and Minister of Finance from 2009 to 2012. An independent politician, she represented the Antikalnis electoral district in the Lithuanian parliament and was one of the few politicians elected in the first round. In 2020, Shimunitsa was nominated to become Lithuania's prime minister and won with support across several parties. She is the second woman to hold the premiership of Lithuania. Prime Minister Shimunitsa's administration has focused on restructuring the civil service and strengthening national security. Situated along the Baltic Sea, modern-day Lithuania was consolidated as the Grand Duchy of Lithuania in the 13th century. In the 16th century, the Grand Duchy joined with Poland to form one of Europe's largest states and earliest adopters of democratic values. A series of partitions by foreign powers in the 1700s shrunk the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and dissolved it in 1795. The Russian Empire took over Lithuanian land, but Russian influence prompted a resurgence of Lithuania's cultural pride in the 19th century. The 1905 Russian Revolution weakened Russian control over Lithuania, and the region liberalized. Lithuanian delegates declared independence in 1918, but the country continued to face German, Polish, and Soviet offensives, threatening Lithuania's territorial integrity. Lithuania's independence was short-lived. The Soviet Union forced Lithuania to accept a Treaty of Mutual Assistance in 1939 and fully occupied the country in 1940. In June 1940, the United States issued the Sumner Wells Declaration, condemning the Soviet Union's illegal occupation and annexation of the Baltic states, which became the centerpiece of U.S. non-recognition policy during the Cold War. From 1941 to 1944, Nazi Germany occupied Lithuania, brutally killing nearly all Lithuanian Jews. After 1944, the Soviet Union seized Lithuania once again. Roughly 30,000 Lithuanians, based largely in the countryside, fought a nine-year guerrilla war for independence. The Soviets enacted repressive measures, reinstituted deportations to Siberia and engaged in a massive russification campaign that lasted until the Soviet government initiated its thaw under Premier Nikita Khrushchev following Joseph Stalin's death in 1953. Over the following decades, Lithuania underwent large-scale industrialization and urbanization. Lithuania became the first Soviet state to restore independence when its parliament declared independence on March 11, 1990. The next year, Lithuania codified a new constitution and joined the United Nations. In the 1990s, Lithuania signed friendship and cooperation treaties with Poland and Russia. Throughout the early 2000s, Lithuania joined a number of continent-wide and international coalitions, including the WTO in 2001, NATO and the EU in 2004, and OECD in 2018. In 2022, the United States and Lithuania celebrated their 100th anniversary of diplomatic relations. The United States and Lithuania are NATO allies with strong security and defense partnership. They are strategic partners on issues including energy independence, democracy, Russia, Ukraine, and support to Taiwan. Lithuania was among the first allies to offer solidarity and support to the United States after the 9-11 attacks and it led the Provincial Reconstruction Team in Afghanistan's Gore Province from 2005 to 2013. 
A large Lithuanian diaspora in the United States actively contributed to Lithuania's freedom fight, bolstering the country's relations following independence, and continues to reinforce relations today. We welcome Prime Minister Shimunitsa to discuss the future of European security, energy security, the future of NATO, Russia's brutal reinvasion of Ukraine and aggression against Europe and the West, and prospects for strengthening the free world for the long competition against authoritarianism. Prime Minister Ingrida Shimonita, welcome to Battlegrounds. It is a privilege to host you. Thank you for making time for our audience and me at a, at a very busy and, and critical time. Thank you for having me on this uh, on this debate, and I think uh, it is a, a very uh, good time to try to uh, explain maybe sometimes things that are not so obvious for people who are a little bit uh, further from from the place where I live, and uh, maybe sometimes things that we do seem to be uh, um, worth explanation or or worth some. Uh, some uh, additional discussion. Although, uh, ironically, we live in a in a times where it's so often, you know, we we have a a situation where we have the right to say we've told you so, and this is, you know, a very a very bad feeling, I must say, because if uh, somebody would have wanted to be wrong. So it's us who would have been uh, happy, much happier than we are now uh, if we were wrong about our um, view on uh, what might happen in Europe. How dangerous is this uh, illusion of Wandel durch Handel with uh, Putin and attempt to trade him into civilization, something that was very uh, very successful for countries like Mai, who after occupation were sort of hungry, you know, to become part of the Western world because we always thought we belonged there. So uh, for us, this was a natural transition. We were very quick and, and, and fast in sort of uh, adapting our legislation, uh, encouraging freedom of speech, uh, honoring human rights, um, independence of courts, anything that is, you know, the, the values, the, the values of a, of a democracy. Russia was never even uh, sincere in, in this, or maybe in the beginning of 90s, you know? But I think what was not done uh, at that time, um, the country and the nation had no uh, obligation to rethink its past. And what we see now is this, you know, rebirth of this grandeur, if you might use this, you know, a word, what, what, what they always sort of were uh, saying and claiming about themselves, that they are the victorious nation of the Second World War, and they were portraying it as if they did it themselves, as if there were no United States, no land lease, no Western partners, no allies, no nobody. It was just Russia who, who won against Nazis. And, you know, this, this thing that the Stalinism uh, crimes were never thought through. There was no real reconciliation with what happened, for example, to nations like mine who've been exterminated, sent over to Siberia, deported, uh, sent to jails, and, and what, what not. I mean, this is unfortunately now is, is fueling this, uh, this war that I think many of us uh, were at least willing not to see on the, on, on the soil of Europe. You, you said at the outset, you know, that you are much closer than, than we are to the, to the problem of Russia. In fact, you're one of only four NATO countries that border Russia. And, and Lithuania has been a strong voice about what I, I agree with you was a delusion that Vladimir Putin, having been welcomed into the international community, being able to sell gas and, and oil, for example, to, to Germany and, and the rest of Europe, would see that it was to his benefit to... to uh, uh, to play by the rules, right, and to stop the sustained campaign of subversion. Uh, on this, uh, in the series, we have this theme called strategic narcissism. We define that as our tendency to define the world only in relation to us, and assume that we would what we would like to do or not do 
is decisive toward achieving the desired outcome. And, and the corrective to that is strategic empathy to view this complex problem set associated with the revanchist hypernationalist Kremlin through the perspective of others. And there's nobody better than you to help us with that. You've taken such a strong stand in defense of democracy in, in Lithuania. Your country's provided the most support of any country as a percentage of, of GDP to the Ukrainians. And but more broadly, you know, you've, you've, you've supported the idea that people should have a say in how they're governed uh, in neighboring Belarus, for example, and in Russia itself, and as far as way as Taiwan. So you've given asylum to, to more than 10,000 democracy activists from, from Russia and Belarus. Could you maybe explain to our viewers why you and your country prioritize advocacy for democracy and freedom? Well, um... I must say that, uh, you know, Lithuania is not a huge country by a territory or by population. We might think that we are great, but it's it's different from, you know, from a populous country with a big territory. And what, what I think is important for countries like my country is that it's not just the alliances, not just, you know, the, the, the grouping of countries where you try to be with the ones of uh, that are similar to you, but the whole concept of the rules-based world is something that is uh, a safety net for countries like mine, because we do not have the comfort of, you know, of bilateral dealings where well, big countries often do have this privilege of sort of trying to bilaterally uh, find a solution. And that's why I think uh, Germany had this, uh, has taken this risk or because it was not just about buying gas, you know, or, or buying oil, because many countries were buying gas and buying oil. It's a problem that the economy itself became hooked on 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 the um, on, on the cheap, supplies cheap natural gas right yeah on, on yes. the supplies of Russian gas and that became uh, a very significant weakness of economy as today although it was seen like a, you know a strength of exports as a couple of years before but again I think that uh, Germany thought that we will find a way to deal with Russia if something happens. But of course, the war was not in the calculations because actually when we were thinking that and we were saying that, look, there is a significant risk that he will be out for territories rather than economic interest or um, influence or um, interference in, in sort of uh, internal affairs of many countries, something Kremlin was doing along the way, but they will also go for land. Uh, uh, quite many people were saying that we are paranoid, that we have this, you know, trauma, and that's why we are so, uh, that's why we are so, uh, so cautious about, about Russia. For us, and for me personally, and I think for many people in my country, this is not, you know, a debate uh, for uh, part of Ukrainian land, where you know Ukraine is fighting Russia and two neighboring countries fighting. For me, this is a, and and here I ironically share the view of uh, Mr. Putin, who says that it's NATO who is after him. So uh, not this way, but a way that he is fighting the values. He is fighting the whole concept of the democracy, of the democratic world, of the idea that people are free to choose whatever way they want their country to, uh, uh, to develop. And if they want to be part of Europe, European Union, NATO, or other alliances, then this is the sovereign right of sovereign people. And this is not for Putin to dictate just because this is a neighboring country and he thinks this is his sphere of influence. So I don't want to be his sphere of influence. Nobody in this country wants. And, and that's why we are so, uh, so um, voiceful to, to make clear that this is not, a, it is happening on Ukrainian soil. But the war is not of Ukrainians, you know. This is the war of democracies against uh, totalitarian authoritarian regimes. You know, Prime Minister, we talk a lot about black swans, right? These unanticipated events that have significant consequences. I think the reinvasion of Ukraine was a pink flamingo. I mean, it was right in front of us, and it was quite obvious. But if you if you consider what uh, what Putin has done over many years, right? This is the sustained campaign of political subversion and disinformation 
the you know the the massive cyber attacks going back to 2003 on on especially Estonia but on, on your nation and others as well the invasion of Georgia in 2007 uh the speech he gave in Munich that same year where he just basically said what he was going to do and yeah. then and then of course the the initial invasion of Ukraine in 2014 there's so many examples but could you maybe share your view on what did the transatlantic community, what did NATO and the EU get wrong? You said you don't really want to just take credit for it, but you have, your country has been uh, a, a strong voice that Putin must be deterred and, and we have to be more resolute in deterring Putin. We failed, obviously, in, in connection with this renewed invasion of, uh, of, of Ukraine. But what, what, what you share your thoughts on what, what we got wrong and what, the, what lessons we should learn from this recent history to apply to the future and, and efforts to deter Putin in the future? Well, I think that the main uh, problem that was uh, in, in understanding of Russia, but I still see it present, maybe to a lesser extent, but some people still don't want to give up, uh, is the, 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 <laughs> the, um, the idea that we, we, well, we, uh, not me personally, but, but quite many of my colleagues from other countries, they tend to evaluate Putin uh, as if he were one of us. This is mirror imaging. This is, uh, this is part of strategic narcissism, mirror imaging. And, and, uh, and this is, for our viewers, you know, when you hear the words off-ramp, I think you should run for the exits, right? <laughs> I think the... <laughs> Because when there is this idea, we need to uh, save face uh, of Russia. We do not, we must not let Russia lose. We must not let Ukraine lose, but we also must not let Russia lose because this is humiliating and stuff. Uh, because Putin has to save face. I mean, he's not one of us. He does not have to face neither his population, nor free press, no opposition, no uh, fair trial uh, and, 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 and court, if, if need may be. Nothing of the things we have in our part of the world. And if he wants to portray something as victory in his propaganda uh, media, then he will be very successful. Because there was a, a survey uh, a week ago, I think, in Russia, and uh, people were asked, do you want this war to stop? Or do you want this war to continue? Uh, and of course, you might say that, you know, the polls are not really a very uh, much telling in a, in, a, in a country like Russia under circumstances like they are. But still, I think this is quite illustrative because uh, there was like water of people who were saying we want this war to stop, uh, water saying we want this war to continue. And then the rest were saying whatever Putin decides. So um, ironically, this 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 is very sad to to sort of to, to to get the sense how 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 people feel, but this is also means that Putin does not have to save his face um, in front of anyone. I mean, whatever face he wants, he draws this face, and that's it. So I think that was the the biggest illusion, trying to to sort of judge him like he's uh, he's under the normal. Uh, political circumstances, uh, like he would be a German chancellor or prime minister of Spain or or or, or Norway, which is not the case. So definitely, uh, definitely, this still uh, has has implications. But I think if if we speak about the lessons for the future and and the and the situation, uh, what what comes next? First and foremost, I think that we must do whatever it takes so that Russia loses this war. And there should be no, you know, like way of going around this concept and saying that we, we should do something in between, you know, no nobody's losing and nobody's winning. Right. I mean, Ukraine must win this war. And if Ukraine wins this war, it means Russia loses. And what happens next? I don't know, because there are quite many scenarios, not all of them good, or quite few of them good, as a matter of fact. But what if there is at some point a situation where uh, Western countries will have to offer something like Marshall Plan to Russia, uh, this definitely must come with the condition of a uh, Russian nation um, sort of getting in, in some, uh, in some uh, rational uh, 
uh, rethinking of their past. Because otherwise, this will be just buying time for, for, for some next period. And, and this will come up again because there will be another leader who will again speculate on the sentiment that people have because he will fail to uh, provide a decent uh, level of living and welfare and public services and everything. So he will ignite this uh, imperialistic ambition uh, time and again because this was the Russian history was like that throughout, I know, centuries. You know, Prime Minister, you're making me think of a, of a quote uh, from George Orwell that he who controls the, the present controls the past and he who controls the past controls the future. And authoritarian regimes manipulate the past to stoke this sort of jingoistic nationalist sentiment and to protect themselves from criticism. We see that going on now with the, the Chinese Communist Party Congress <laughs> and, and, uh, and that authoritarian regime. Lithuania has taken a strong stance on Chinese uh, Communist Party authoritarianism uh, and aggression. Now, it, it does seem we are, that we are in a competition between authoritarianism and, and democracy. And, and of course, for us to prevail, we have to maintain our will. You've already touched on this a little bit, but what is your assessment of, of, of not only just your country, but you're a member of the EU and of NATO? What is your assessment of our ability to maintain our will to defend our democracies, especially under duress, like we see the, the courageous Ukrainians fighting, but also Putin's use of, of energy for coercive purposes or Putin rattling his nuclear saber. Do you think we have the will to prevail in this competition? Well, I must say that I very much believe so. And it's not just a matter of belief, because I think there is a couple of things that uh, Putin miscalculated when he started this invasion. First and foremost, of course, he miscalculated the um, the Ukrainian um, uh, strength uh, and their will and their uh, commitment to defend their land, which is, I think, a sort of a major uh, a major thing here. But I think his uh, pre uh, condition or his uh, initial idea was that uh, it will be. Uh, if he does something, then it will be, you know, another round of uh, very deep concerns from Western leaders and uh, and not a real reaction like it was in 2014, not speaking about Georgia in 2008. And this will leave him, you know, with all the options on the table. He will take over control of Ukraine. Uh, everybody in the West will be unhappy. Some Baltic countries will go around sort of shouting and screaming that, look what, what, what's happening, somebody will be next. But nothing will really change because there are so many economic interests and so many so many money, you know, in the, in, in, in the turnover that, that, you know, nobody will risk to stop it. And uh, he crossed the line. I mean, something sort of uh, switched off in, in the previous thinking of, um, of our part of the world for, uh, and he was also betting on, you know, those typical transatlantic grunge between European Union and United States. The language is, of strategic autonomy comes to yeah, mind. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, uh, strategic autonomy from United States, something that I do not find uh, a, a good idea. And all of a sudden, uh, there was a very strong unity between U European Union, UK, US, also broader transatlantic community, meaning also South uh, uh, and uh, Indo-Pacific countries of, 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 the same, of the same thinking. There were sanctions that were introduced immediately, there was immediate decision that we will supply Ukraine with uh, weapons, uh, uh, of course, not all the countries, but at least part of the countries, and then uh, other countries followed suit. So I think this was his biggest miscalculation. And this brings uh, optimism to me that actually now we understand at a very high price, at the price of people being killed every day, at, at the price of women being raped, at the price kids being slaughtered, uh, at this price that Ukrainians are paying by their lives, by their people, we understand that, you know, this is not a fight about a piece of land. and. Uh, the uh, U-turn of, uh, um, of the German uh, understanding about defense and security that happened in the end of February where the Chancellor announced a huge package of investment into military 
defense and, 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 and also, also production of weapons. I think this was something nobody was expecting to happen, if not this war. And the countries are increasing their defense spending. And, you know, ironically, President Trump was so unhappy about the spending in, in, in European countries as a percentage of GDP. Now, I think there will be less and less countries that do not cope with the uh, 2%. And there will be more and more countries that understand that 2% is not enough, including my country. So, um, so I think this is, uh, this is uh, a very significant shift. And this is not happening without reason. This is happening for a reason, because all of a sudden, you know, you, you watch uh, what's happening in Ukraine and you understand that, uh, oh, my God, we need to defend what we have, because one day, all of a sudden, uh, we might lose what we've created in 80 years after Second World War. My country in 30 years after occupation, but the broader Europe, 80 years of after Second World War were the years of, you know, of uh, building the countries, um, increasing prosperity, building connectivity, everything about, you know, staying together, being richer, uh, more experienced. And all of a sudden you understand that there is a moron in a, in a red house that can actually uh, create, uh, that can send your, your previous life to just down, down the road and, and you will have nothing. You know, Prime Minister, you're making such an important point that the cost of deterring war is far less than the cost of war itself. And and uh, I just wonder what would have happened if all the capabilities that have been provided to Ukraine now to defend itself have been provided a few years ago. And mm -hmm. uh, and I know that, that you've been a very strong voice for increasing defense spending. You've, you've increased defense spending to over 2.5% now of, of GDP. Lithuania will host the NATO summit next year. I wonder if you might share your hopes and expectations for that summit and your assessment of, of the strength of NATO as Finland and Sweden will be joining. I mean, really, the, it's the exact opposite of what Vladimir Putin wanted, yeah. is he was obsessed with breaking NATO apart. And it seems like the prognosis is pretty good now, but I'd love to hear your assessment. Well, this is one of the Putin's achievement uh, because the, the the fact that Finland and Sweden decided to uh, to uh, appeal for membership in NATO was also something uh, nobody would have been expecting a year ago because well. Uh, uh, it, it, it was not somewhere, in the, you know, in the seaside, and and this changed this this invasion changed uh, their understanding about the security, and we find it very useful for our security as well, because now all the countries in the region, bar from Kaliningrad, uh, oblast, will be uh, NATO NATO countries, and and that will alleviate also our our cooperation and 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 how we how we define the the common goals now coming back to nato which is uh, in the general stance of nato um uh, i will recall that you know putin is fighting nato as you might understand because he he usually uh, tries to, to 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 say that you know we have nato against us not just ukrainians so this is this is why uh, this this is why we 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 need to fight this war because it's NATO NATO, who's been expanding uh, towards the borders of Russia, which is not true, because the forward presence appeared in, in the region only after he invaded uh, Crimea and Donbass. And we found it very complicated for so many years, actually, to persuade our colleagues in NATO that the threat is real. And now we see the Madrid summit uh, conclusions where it is written black on white, that Russia is a threat. So we've been waiting for this constatation for quite many years, and now we have it. And it means that there is a need of strengthening of Eastern NATO flank because of what happened in Ukraine. We also see uh, the way uh, Russia is fighting, uh, and we see what's left when Russia is expelled from the territories. We see that it's only misery and deaths and corpses of shot cyclists that you actually find on, on the ground. It means that the preparation uh, for, uh, for defense, which in itself means 
deterrence because you deter by 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 uh, by showing that you re- you are ready to defend um, uh, must be must be strengthened and these agreements have been achieved uh, uh, politically on, on on Madrid summit and I think in in, in, in next year's summit uh, this will be debated in in, in terms of practicalities I have little doubt that if Ukraine, would uh, were provided the uh, the uh, military uh, support uh, before this war, uh, they could have saved at least so many lives. Right. But there were all ideas about why this should not be done. I'm proud to say that my country uh, was providing Ukraine with military support before this invasion, and we were in a in a very short list of of countries who were doing so, including United States, also some other countries. O- other countries were reluctant. I know that some of the countries were not really trust trusting the um, the uh, intelligence information about this buildup being a real uh, preparation for real invasion. There were all sorts sort of doubts. And this is, again, you know, uh, what, what is also a problem in this region. People sometimes tend to think their rationality in line of our rationality. I mean, everybody would say this makes no sense. What did Putin achieve? He got such big losses. He showed that his second world largest army is, well, uh, I, I cannot comment on this uh, professionally, but most probably you, you you can comment on this professionally much better than mine. But but I mean, even for me, when when you look at how many people, uh, what uh, what problems they they solve with logistics, with everything, it looks like you know. Uh, Poor discipline, know. lack of training, yeah, inability uh, to uh, fight uh, together as combined arms and joint teams. It was it's a Potemkin army. I think it's clear that they you know they look really good at on May Day parades. Uh, but don't look so good on the battlefield. Exactly. And this is also something you would not want to show to uh, to other people who are potentially your sort of uh, enemies, uh, as, as, as he's portraying this. So in, in practical ter- terms, this makes no rationality, I mean, no sense for a, for a rational leader. But his rationality is different rationality from the one that, that we usually sort of consider, because he, he has to feed his uh, population with something he gives instead of welfare and development. And this is this, you know, this imperialistic flavor, uh, this propaganda and this everything that actually works as a homeopathic thing for for things that uh, population in our countries would demand from politicians. You know, Prime Minister, for Americans, you know, there's oftentimes the question of, why does it matter to us? And I, I think it's it's quite clear that a conflict like this is dangerous for the whole world and has ramifications for the whole world. Uh, we know that the humanitarian catastrophe has not remained contained to Ukraine. It's created a refugee crisis. I think you have over 70,000 Ukrainian refugees uh, in, in Lithuania. And then, of course, we've seen the effect on, on global energy markets, uh, as well as this, this food crisis that some people are calling Farmageddon. So I, what... What do you think is necessary now uh, to be able to respond to so- sort of the global nature of this conflict from an energy security perspective and from really you know, access to agricultural goods? What do you think we need to learn at, from, uh, from the, these sort of uh, broader effects and, and, uh, and how can we, you know, what actions do we need to take now? Uh, this is a very important question and a very timely one because uh, it's no coincidence that uh, Putin currently is speaking so much about peace negotiations. And he does not want peace, neither he wants negotiations. He wants that somebody would make uh, President Zelensky and Ukrainian government to uh, sort of uh, take this, what, what, what happened on the ground as a fait accompli. So that because he he sees the losses he's suffering, he sees this um, disaster with mobilization, he sees that he has real problems with sort of uh, ca- ca- counteracting the uh, the uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian army. So he wants some briefing space, and this we we can understand. And for this, he tries to frighten us. 
he tries to frighten us, you know, Europe will, will freeze, uh, you will have energy bills that you cannot sustain, and people will go bankrupt, businesses will go bankrupt. And this is something he's feeding through the media channels or some political groups that are sympathetic to, to Putin. He is also uh, poisoning the global south with the idea that it's because of Europe and it's because of sanctions imposed by Europe. Uh, those countries uh, have high food price and there is a, a, a significant lack of, of supply for wheat, uh, corn, and, and, and other basic, basic food. So I think what we need to do, we definitely cannot blink because if we blink, then it will mean that we will not be able to sustain our ground because uh, appeasement never bring peace. This I know for sure. This will never bring peace with Putin. So what he needs to know that we are a strong community. We have a significant level of welfare to shelter our people and our businesses from this problem. At the same time, we must do everything we can to make this uh, process of decoupling from Russian energy irreversible. Because if there is an illusion that we will be able to come back, you know, to business as usual, I would claim this is an illusion because uh, it might happen maybe 50 years from now, but, but not in a, in a very foreseeable future. And given that Europe is on the track to get rid of fossil fuels whatsoever, so we don't need to waste uh, time. We just need to move fast forward with our uh, green agenda, renewables, and, and at the same time looking for reliable partners that we have that can, can support us with, uh, with gas and, and, and oil and everything. And we also need to make our case, and this is a joint effort by all the transatlantic community, to make our case against the countries in Global South, who are so much fooled by Russia that I sometimes find it, you know, um, at some level of sarcasm, because I... When I see those countries uh, supporting Russia because the West is colonialistic, and you see how Putin is using this argument in his speeches and everywhere. I mean, he is fighting a colonial war. What he is doing is a colonial war par excellence. And so nobody in, in Africa, in Middle East, have no good reasons actually to to uh, to support Russia in this debate unless the leaders of those countries are um, equal war criminals like uh, Assad in, in in Syria or 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 uh, Kim in in North Korea. So we we need to make this case stronger because in so many cases where we have voting, for example, in the United Nations General Assembly. It is so important to see that some countries do not understand that this is not because of, of uh, the West defending liberal democracy, uh, but because of Putin started this um, unjustifiable war. Uh, we have those repercussions in, in, in food markets and energy markets, and we simply need to provide help where, where we can do so. Well, Prime Minister, I hope the U.S. comes to our senses and we we become a big part of the energy solution as well. Yeah. In terms of, uh, I'm thinking in terms of especially LNG exports and, but your voice is so strong in this competition for, you know, for the sentiments uh, of those in, in the global South, and I really appreciate it. I'd like to ask you just one final broad question, and then then ask you just for your closing thoughts and what you'd like to to tell our our, our audience, but. I know this is a tough question to ask, but how do you see this ending? What do you think the prospects are for the war in Ukraine and, and, and more broadly? Uh, I know it's impossible to predict at this stage, uh, but but what what how do you see this war ending? Well, it's you know uh, not easy for for a random politician to speculate on how this war will end. I know how I want it to end. <laughs> I want Ukraine to win uh, undoubtedly and restore its uh, territorial uh, integrity and defend its sovereignty. But I know it's easier to say than to do because uh, it's dependent on so many things that are beyond Ukraine's control, as unfortunately. And one of the major factors is the level of military support that countries here will provide 
to Ukraine because Ukraine is fighting this war, but it it ha- it needs to have means. And we know that at the same time, Russia uh, losing on the battleground will be indiscriminately uh, shelling and attacking civilians. And there will be huge casualties and there will be huge losses of lives in playgrounds and hospitals. And there will be losses of, of critical infrastructure such as electricity or, 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 or heating, which is crucial for the winter. So, I mean, what is happening on the ground is, as a matter of fact, a genocide. And uh, the level of resistance of Ukrainian people will also also depend on how strong the support they feel from our side. And I can speak for myself. I know that, you know, in my country, people, including myself, will do whatever we can to, to, um, to support Ukraine. I know that in other countries, there will be voices that will say, this is not our war, let's leave it, because energy bills are so high, rating polls are so low, everything is, you know, is so bad. We, we became too committed to to this, uh, to this fight, which is not of our own. And this is a very big mistake because this is a very short-sighted. If Putin sees that somebody blinks, then he will use this weakness to the extent possible. So uh, I wanted to stop as soon as possible. I think nobody, you know, uh, wants this, this war to stop as, as soon as possible as we in a civilized world do. But of course, what, what we also know uh, as a rule-based community, we also know that this peace cannot come behind the back of Ukraine. I mean, nobody can decide for Ukraine what is a victory for Ukraine. And this is crucial. Thank you, Prime Minister. Prime Minister, I'd like to ask you what, what other, uh, what, what you'd like to talk to our audience about, even from just maybe a leadership perspective. You're an extraordinarily strong woman leader. You have many strong women leaders in your government. Anything you'd like to share with our audience about your experience and and, uh, and and what you've learned about, about leadership? Well, I think um, it is, you know, uh, sometimes the privilege of uh, smaller countries uh, to be uh, a little bit less diplomatic, maybe a little bit more straightforward, but, uh, but trying to persuade uh, the broader community on the things that might not be so well seen, you know, when you look from the distance or where you are really big and responsible for everything what's happening around the globe, like the United States and have so many places to watch. But, but, uh, but I think that, you know, people sometimes tend to think that uh, liberal democracy and the, the values of liberal democracy being that freedom of speech or human rights or private property for that matter that are very important and also independent courts, uh, free elections is something that is given. You know, it's like an air that you breathe. Uh, and why should you bother about the air? But if all of a sudden somebody would poison the air, then that's the end of story. And that's why we cannot take that for granted. And I know that people sometimes in France or in Spain or in, or in Netherlands ask me, why is it so that you are so sensitive to, 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 to this? And I'm saying, look, my country is independent, has a restored independence 32 years ago. So, so many people uh, in this country living still remembers, you know, this sound of Soviets. And even for me, you were speaking about this rewriting of history and, and, and this Orwell. I was a child and I had like a couple of grades in a Soviet school. So uh, the moment when I understood that R- Russia is actually going backwards was when I heard that they reinstated the Soviet uh, anthem and that they started to rewrite the Soviet textbook about the Second World War. And this was a sign for me that I feel it like, you know, like going back to my childhood where there was Soviet childhood. So this is something we have a very, very thin ear to, 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 to those noises and to those sounds and, 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 and to those smells. 
And the countries that after Second World War were occupied by building their country were sort of all the time uh, striving for better competition, better products, better services, higher wages, higher level of, of welfare. I mean, it, it was so much further from, the, from them. That's why they just take the, uh, the, uh, the idea of liberal democracy for granted, like it is the ear. And somebody has to say that, you know, air is... This is crucial for our way of living, but we must understand that we must be very careful so that nobody would poison this air, because if our air is poisoned, then uh, we, cannot, we cannot go on like, like, like uh, living like, like, like we live. And as I say, if there will be no end of war in Ukraine, then there will be no end. Well, Prime Minister, I can't think of a better way to end it as a historian. Your, your emphasis on understanding the past as a way to, 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 to understand the present and make a projection to the future really is, is music to my ears. And uh, Prime Minister Shimonita, I, I, I can't thank you enough on behalf of the Hoover Institution uh, for helping us learn more about battlegrounds important to building a future of peace and, and prosperity for generations to come. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your leadership at this critical time. Thanks a lot for having me. That was a very... Good debate, I think. Thank you.